Well, good morning. If you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's table together, so it's always a special Sunday when we get to remember that uh, corporately to sit shoulder to shoulder and just look again at our blessed hope and what unites us and joins us. So it's, it's been a good season. The Lord is doing a lot of special things in the body right now, and I just want to go before Him and just pray and ask that He would meet us here now as we continue our worship. I want you to realize that we continue worshiping now through the Word of God. And so let, let's worship this morning with God to Him in First Peter chapter 2. Father, we come before You and we thank You uh, for the high privilege that we have in Christ. We thank You that we were dead in trespasses and sins. And God, You called us forth. You spoke and said, Lazarus, come forth, and you raised us from the dead, and we responded to the call of God to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you. You opened our eyes to see him as a treasure hidden in a field, and we were willing to sell all that we might have Christ. I thank you for that pearl of great price, and I thank you that we have been staring at the cornerstone, and we've been looking and learning and seeing all of his beauty and what happens when we build and find all of our life upon Christ. And I pray that your spirit would continue to show us more of him, that you would reveal even more of his glory this morning in this word, and we would behold it and we would be metamorphosed into this image. God, we desire to reflect Christ to this world. And so I pray, Lord, that you would meet us. You've inspired this word, and we're asking now that you would illuminate it to our minds and hearts and souls this morning. Father, may you be worshiped as your word is explained, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 23 this morning, and then next week we'll look at verses 24 through 25. So uh, we we had a snow cancellation last week. I was going to land verses 24 and 25 perfectly for Communion Sunday. So man plans his ways, but God directs his steps. So let me set the context again, if you'll look with me. Uh, In chapter uh, 1, verse 13, this has been our transition. We looked at the the gospel uh, for almost six months in, in this transition. Therefore, in light of the gospel, knowing it, understanding it, having experienced its realities, therefore, here's the kind of life that you are to live. How do we respond to this great salvation that God has given us in Christ? How should we live in light of such amazing grace that has been shed upon us? How can I live in such a way that in this morning, in verse 20 of chapter 2, he says, this will find favor with God. I want to live in such a way that it finds favor with God. When I read things like that, my ears perk up. This finds favor with God. And in this section, we're going to be dealing with some sins and some commands by God that are not talked about as much as they should be. They they don't usually make the top 10 list of the sins that we're fighting. I've had very few people come to me in counseling over my time in ministry saying, I'm struggling with a lack of submission to the government. Or how do I respond to authority or bosses who are unreasonable? That's what Peter is flushing out for us right now in his epistle to the saints who are scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so don't miss, again, why is Peter addressing these issues? He he wants people who are aliens, who have been chosen by God to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of that darkness unto his marvelous light. That's what Peter's after. The ones who were once not a people now are the people of God in this temple that he's building with Jew and Gentile. This is now the ingathering of the nations. And he wants us to show forth God. So the church, our calling is we are to show forth God to this world. We are to live such different lives that the world will glorify God one day because of your life on the day of their visitation when they get saved. We are seeking to make God visible by his character and saving power being seen in us individually and corporately. That's what we're striving for. We are to love, Peter said, like no other. We have agape that is beyond what anything this world has, and we're praying that people will see us and say, what is the hope within you? So Peter is addressing the issue that we began our study with 
And Peter's battle, that, that first sermon we looked at was submission. He would not submit to God. I'm going to be crucified. And he grabs Jesus and rebukes him and says, no way. They come to arrest him. He takes his sword out. No way. He just keeps fighting the plan of God. God breaks him. Uh, he's broken deeply at the cross where he denies him three times. And now he writes this day. The government and society are pressing upon them and they're squeezing them and they're persecuting the church to where they're scattered now. And we know shortly Nero's gonna begin killing the Christians. And so what screams to Peter is you need to submit to God who is over all of this. God is over all of this and he's working it for his glory and for your good. And so it's coming, it's heating up, but remember this is all from the hand of God. Don't lose your thinking and your understanding what's going on, everything's spinning out of control. This is all unfolding perfectly according to the plan and will of God. We trust him when it makes no logical sense to you. Come under his mighty hand, that's the safe place for the child of God. And that is what God will use to save and silence the ignorance of foolish men. That is how they're going to see the excellencies of God, a sweet, submissive people to the hand of God. Peter is addressing practically then the issues before this church. The state has Nero and Pilate and Herod, not the greatest men you'd want to submit to for government. And Peter called last time we were together to submit to the authorities that God has put over you and, and a couple of you ask questions. If they ask you to sin, your submission stops. Your submission is to God. And if they try to get you to sin against God, your submission ends there. So I want to make sure that you understand that. A couple of you are wondering about that. This morning, we're going to look at a servant where you work and live with a master who's unreasonable and abusive. And these are areas that Peter's saying, you can put God on display by your submissive and loving spirits. By showing trust in God and trusting ourselves to the one uh, God and to his care, we can put him on display. I was thinking this week about King David. King David has been wronged by Saul. He, he's done, David's done nothing wrong. All he's been is righteous. And in and, and, and jealousy, uh, Saul is pursuing him, trying to kill him. He was a fugitive in the wilderness for about a year and a half running from this man. And finally the Lord comes and, and delivers, Saul's delivered right into his hands in a cave, and now David can put him to death and be done with this cruel tyranny that he's been under. And he says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And there's a submission to God even when he has his chance to get rid of this person who is destroying him. So what we look at this morning is not just... How do I deal with a difficult boss? I, I think when I first came to this, that's the first thing I got when I read it. How do I deal with a difficult boss? But the question, if you stay in the context, is how do I magnify God in difficult circumstances that I find myself with abusive authority? How, how do I glorify God is the question. Not how do I deal with a difficult boss? How do I glorify God with a difficult boss? This could be one of the toughest areas that we will face in following Jesus Christ. As I just want you to hear this simple principle. It's suffering and then glory. And so the call to the Christian is it's, it's a path of suffering to glory. I want you to see that. Not my will be done, but yours, O oh God. May God move in power in our hearts in a time when everything is about our rights. We live in a day, my rights, gay rights, people's rights, women's rights, everything in this day is a fight about your rights. And we have brought that little spirit right into the church. And Peter's telling us this morning, it must die. It must die. Uh, and he's the right one, I think, to teach us this morning. This is the, the, we're learning from a guy who got this and he was broken and he modeled it and changed and transformed into the image of Christ. So this morning, uh, let's take up and hear Peter's words. How do we deal with this? So here's your outline. We're going to look at verses 18 to 23 and Peter's going to show us how to respond to unjust treatment as servants. And in verses 18 through 20, we're going to look at the command for submission and suffering and then in verses 21 through 23, he's going to show us the example of submission and suffering. So we get our command, and then we get probably the highest uh, example that we could ever have of this whole principle that Peter's going to teach us in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So let's take up in verse 18 through 20 the command for submission and suffering. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. <clears throat> verse 18, our first point then under that is a principle. The principle in verse 18 is servants, be submissive uh, to your masters. And so I want to just look at servants. I, I like this word, it's better than employees. I think we need this perspective. I am a servant. I am the servant of all. Uh, go back to verse 16 of chapter 2. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. You have freedom to be a bond slave of God. And that is how we look at our lives here on this earth as believers. We've been redeemed, and now I am a bond slave of God to serve Him and thus to serve others. And so I am free to serve, to be the servant of all. And so Peter's conclusion last week in verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. We respect everyone. When we are abused, we endure it. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So once you are saved, you've been born again to a living hope, you've now, uh, you're, you're reoriented back to everything revolving with God as your center reference point, and it is no longer about how can others serve me. This is how you know that you've been born again. It's not how can everyone in this world serve me. I'm the son, and everything revolves around me and my plans and my desires. I am here to serve and not to be served. We no longer enter our places like work, our family, our church, our neighborhood, and say, what can I get? How can this person serve me? To walk into a church, what can everyone do for me? To walk into my family, I'm the dad, everyone needs to serve me. And now uh, the, the gospel is, I just want to serve. That is the freedom of being a slave of God. Has this happened or is it happening in your life? Have you been born again to where now it's no longer, I just want to be served, but I want to serve. This is no longer about me. This is about God. This is a nice way to know whether you're religious and it's all still about you or if you've been born again to this living God. And so I like this address, servants. This is our mindset to how we go to work. This is our mindset to how we step into our families. This is our mindset as we enter into the ecclesia, the church. Do you think of yourself this way? Ultimately, I'm a servant of God, and that's how he wants us to live and to think. And so, servants, as you enter into your jobs, and the second person being addressed, he says, is masters, and that's those with authority over us, bosses, husbands, parents, teachers, coaches, the, the, the people we're going to enter into now as we go into society who have authority over us. <clears throat> so what is the conflict between servants and masters that Peter is talking about? What, what is going on with these two groups? And if you'll look with me in verse 18, the, what's going on here, he says, it's those who are unreasonable. They're, they're unreasonable masters and bosses. The Greek word is skolios. What word do you think we get from that? scoliosis, the curvature of the spine. And so they're unreasonable, they're bent, they're, they're crooked. What, what they're asking is unfair. It's ridiculous. It's mistreatment. And so we got someone who's really scoliosis, they're, they're, they're not straight and they're asking and they're mistreating you and they're abusing you. And at the time that this was written, you couldn't just walk away and get another job like we can do today. You, a lot of times you were owned, a slave. And you had to deal with the situation in a way that would show forth God's marvelous light. I think we run so quickly from any kind of pressure or anything like this, we never get to really show forth God's marvelous light. And this morning, what Peter's going to say is, I bring these things for the purpose so you can show my glory to the world. So right here, 
when this happens, master, servant, scoliosis, unreasonable, it matters what happens at this point between a master-servant relationship. This matters to God what happens now when this comes. So what do you do? What do you do when you get mistreated or, or ask something unreasonable at work? Do, do you hate them? Do you get bitter and resentment to where all of your joy now is completely gone? Your whole family uh, runs whenever you come home because dad's a little bit touchy and it's like, I don't want to be near him. Do you gossip and slander the master to all the other employees or how about to all the other kids or how about to all the other siblings? How does God want us to deal with unreasonable authority over us? Well, what does the spirit of the age tell us? The spirit of the age says you, you conquer it, you fight it, you overcome it, you uh, give evil for evil. And we're taught that everywhere. And when you begin to teach what God's word says, uh, you will be ridiculed, rejected, and mocked and scorned like everything that Peter has been telling us. Peter says that here's how I want you to respond. Verse 18, I want you to be submissive with all respect, not just to the good and gentle ones, which is much easier. Isn't it nice to submit to the good and gentle <laughs> Not just those, but he says to the unreasonable. So who Peter is dealing with is not ideal bosses, and in next chapter 3, not ideal husbands. And so these are authorities that they're, they're not ideal, and they're difficult. And most do very well with good and gentle authority. So Peter is dealing with the opposite. And what do you expect him to say? I almost expect Peter to say, draw the sword and cut off his ear. You know, that, that's what you see with Peter, but this is a transformed man. Peter has learned firsthand the advice that he will now give us. Be submissive with all respect. Submission, uh, hupotasso, to rank under. I want you to come under this authority. And if you'll remember again, you are coming under the authority because God has put them in authority. So who I am submitting to is God. And so I bring myself under these people because I am submitting to the living God. I have to believe that they were put over me by God to bring about exactly what God wants to do to keep growing your faith so that you will make it to the end. You remember back to 1 Peter 1, 5, you are protected by God through faith. And he says, I'm gonna stick you in furnaces and I'm gonna purify your faith and burn off impurities so that your faith will make it to the end. God's power is going to protect you, and he's going to do it by perfecting your faith. And now he's saying, I'm going to bring hard bosses and difficult situations into your life to get that faith perfected and grown and strengthened so that you will be those who endure to the end. So it's no mistake in who God puts over you, and it will not always be the good and gentle people because we need to grow, okay? If you don't need to grow, good, easy bosses are perfect, Expect that God will give you some of these for a good purpose. So the response, the command is be submissive with all respect. But I don't respect this madman. How do you respect Nero? What are you going to do with that? So respect is no different than submission. The reason the wives are called to respect their husbands in Ephesians 5 is because God has appointed them with all of their strengths and all of their weaknesses and all of their difficulties, no elbowing right now. Uh, you know, all of those things, they, they were handpicked by God, so I respect that God picked exactly what I needed, wife. And the same thing is I respect this authority because God handpicked the authority over my life and what they're going to do and how hard it's going to be. That is all from God. I respect that God chose my boss. Nero was handpicked for Peter to die under that man and be crucified upside down on a cross, and the church is still being strengthened 2,000 years later. Peter's going to take this advice, and he's going to go under Nero's hand, and he's going to be put up on a cross for the name of Jesus Christ. He's not preaching from an ivory tower. They've been handpicked so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You get to show something by this. You can show the world how a boss like this can't break your peace and your joy because it's found in Christ and he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. That doesn't exist in this world. 
and you start doing this, and you're going to show those around you something beautiful. Praise God for difficult bosses and husbands and authorities who are unreasonable because no one in their flesh would ever respond the way you're going to respond, and it's going to show a great God by your response. They might bite their tongues. I've seen people bite their tongues uh, because of fear. I need a job, so I'm going to let him mistreat me. I've seen people kiss up to try to get a promotion, but no one will submit with respect in the heart and whistle while you work because you have a joy in your soul that this world cannot take away. You get that privilege with this kind of unreasonable authority in your life. Amen? Different way of looking at it, huh? All right. Second, the product that will come from this is why this matters to me. Verse 19, for this, submitting to unreasonable authority, finds favor with God. In the Greek, it just says this is a grace with God. God looks down at one of us with a boss who has wronged us, and we endure it patiently. And God says, that is grace. I love that. That is my grace. This is grace being exercised, given to that person what he does not deserve. This is beautiful, the grace that God will give us to do this. And he says, if for the sake of conscience toward God, you bear up under sorrows when suffering unjustly, please hear this. This is not because you're weak. It's not because he or she is right. And it's not because it is irrelevant. He does not say that. He says the reason is because of conscience toward God. So you're not telling them they're right, you're saying God's right. And this is what I talked about a couple weeks ago, is it's a God-wordness. This is freedom of being a slave of God. I have the freedom to serve God, and so I am free to do this and submit and obey. How does our natural man want to handle this, or or if you're saved, your remaining flesh? You You want to react back. You want to lash out. Some of you, your flesh has a hair trigger response. Someone wrongs you and boom, uh, you you do something to me and I'm just going to respond. If I have no weapon, I'll use my tongue. I, I won't take that from you. And we're all about revenge. And the glory of God will never be seen in a person like that. But if your conscience toward God now kicks in, God, you've loved me with an everlasting love before the foundation of the world. You set it on me, and you sent your son in this world to to accomplish that desire to redeem me and to save me, and you want me now to be like your son, and you want me to endure this treatment that's coming on me. You want me to submit and to respect this authority over my life that you have personally placed over me, and this will give you glory. This is how you, you will silence the foolish and ignorant men. And I am gonna do this then from the heart. Guys, there's no one like this on the face of the earth. This, only believers are ever gonna show this kind of glory and the power of God under these situations. This response is grace. And it finds favor with God. Grace upon grace from God to do this. And it just this beautiful thing that goes on between you and God of worship. What a better response than having a hair trigger and shooting anyone who hurts you or harms you or mistreats you. And that spirit has moved into the church today. And I'm praying if any of you have it, that today we would lay it down and repent and just say, God, I want to glorify you by a whole different spirit under these kind of authorities. This will stand out in our day. This will stand out beautifully because people do not live this way. So the principle is submission to unreasonable people. The product is it finds favor with God. And now in verse 20, I want you to look at there's a precaution and a prerequisite all in this verse. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So the precaution is if you are harshly treated, it literally meant to punch someone in the face. So this is harsh. This is someone who's going to come up and just lay you out. Uh, It's not like, I just don't like your proposal. They're they're coming at you. And, And what good is it if you are sinning 
in your office, or in your home, you're, you're being obnoxious. That's probably the best thing we're good at. I'm just being obnoxious, and I've got an opinion on everything, and I'm throwing it out there, and I'm prideful, I'm boasting, I'm short with people. Your idea is the only idea that can ever be right, and everyone else is wrong. And then you get mistreated by other people in the office because of it. The office rises up against your sin. They're tired of you complaining And they're tired of all your pride while you wear your shirts that say Jesus on them. And he says, if you endure it with patience, hupomeno, to abide under it, you you abide under this persecution, I'm just being persecuted at work because I'm doing all these things that are wrong, but it's because of my faith. I pray before I eat my lunch, so they're coming after me, I know it. And Peter says, what good is that? God gets no glory in all of that. That does not proclaim his excellencies in any way. Actually, it hurts the name of God when we go into our offices and our places and we act and we live like this. It defames God. That's why this is so important. The glory of God is at stake with this issue. So if you need to hear that, let it stick. Just let it stick this morning if that's what you are in your offices and in your homes and the places that you go. You're just obnoxious. And you suffer for that versus I suffer because I'm a gracious, humble, kind, Christ-exalting man or woman. Husbands and dads, wives, you get it in a couple weeks. Husbands and dads, if you sin against your family and you're not a servant like I just described at the beginning, and my wife just won't follow me, And my kids don't respect me. I'm just being harshly treated. Let the word have its way in your heart this morning. I pray that you would be these kind of gracious, humble men in your homes and how you treat your wives and how you treat your children. And that's a precaution. So please don't suffer because you're obnoxious. And now he says, here's a prerequisite then. Here's how I want you to suffer. It says, when you do what is right, in verse 20... This word for right, it means noble or excellent. When you live nobly or excellent among them, what is pleasing to God? Live this way before men because we're going to see Christ was the perfect example of this. And then suffer for that. Suffer. In verse 12 of chapter 2, it says they're going to slander you as evildoers. If you're living this way and they start saying all kinds of evil about you because you're salt and you're getting to them uh, and you don't lash out and you're humbly patient and you just keep enduring it, you abide under it, you submit with respect to God, this finds favor with God. This is what he's looking for. And no one can do this without grace. We need God if we're ever going to respond this way when people wrong us. We must walk in the Spirit of God, looking to Christ, if we'll ever be these kind of people. In your flesh, you will let, you'll have a hair trigger finger. And we need the Spirit of God who's leading us into patience and self-control and all those fruits of the Spirit. This is what it's going to look like in an office to go and be like that. I have watched the sweetest saints get wronged and all their composure goes away and they rage. And there's just there's something within us that hates with a passion to be mistreated or wronged. And you can't sleep. And everything's disturbed. You, you can't even have peace of God anymore because you've been wronged and someone's mistreating you and being difficult. And so, guys, this is so hard, but it's necessary for the glory of God. And so let's help each other grow in this. And when you see it in each other, pray for each other, exhort, admonish one another. Let's strive to to be a people who live this way. And the gnarly Charlies in our bunch, confront them, pray for them. Maybe pray for them for months before you even confront them. And let's just make it where we are a gracious, humble people like Christ as we walk and journey. Amen. So that's the command for submission and suffering. And I want to close out with my second point now is let's look at the example. That's what we're supposed to do. And now let's look at someone who did it. I think the best example there is in verse 21, if you'll look with me. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. What were his steps? Well, he committed no sin 
nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And so let's just kind of pull out now and look at the greatest example in the history of the world of this. This morning we'll look at his example, and then next week we're going to look at his power in verses 24 and 25. He's conquered the dominion of sin so that we can live this kind of life that he's calling us to. We, we can live this kind of life because of this work on the cross that we'll see next week. So verse 21, I, I like this, for you have been called for this purpose. And so this is so important because we live in a time when the prosperity gospel is rising in fame all over the world that God has saved you to give you health, wealth, and prosperity, and everything's just going to go good and well. And all of a sudden, you start finding that you're going to have hard times persecuted, trials are going to come upon you. Jesus never said, I came to give you an easy life. That is not what Peter is saying. We have been called, he says, to this purpose to live righteously before men and to bear up under the sorrows when suffering unjustly. So that's our purpose. We're going to go into this world and live righteous and be humble and gracious and they're going to come at us and they're going to persecute us and we are going to respond graciously the way the Lord Jesus Christ did. That is our calling for this purpose, to live the way that you should. Live the way you should among the Gentiles. And then endure the suffering that will come upon you from a world that hates Jesus Christ. Jesus said, a servant is not above his master, nor is a disciple above his teacher. They will treat you the same way if you walk in his steps. This world will spit you out, and they will hate you, and they will come at you with venom, and they will persecute you, guarantee it. For this purpose, you've been called. Christ also suffered for you. He suffered so much, and his life of suffering ended in crucifixion as he hung on a cross for our sins, and he endured it patiently. The abuses of the devil and the world were thrown at him with an absolute fury. All hell was set against the Son of God, and he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And this one was perfect. No crime, no wrong no trespass or sin. He never had an evil thought or motive. He never spoke an evil word. All he ever did was what was right. He went about doing men good. And his execution was the most unjust execution that's ever been known on this earth. The mock trial, there's never been a greater injustice. He was misunderstood. He was misrepresented. And he was hated. And he was killed. And there has never been a more humble response to such enmity and persecution. He didn't argue his case, but meekly and mildly, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And the only words they could get out of him with all of the verbal abuse, why they're killing him on a tree, was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. They're ignorant. They would never kill if they knew I was the Son of God. Jesus left you an example. This Greek word for example in verse 21 is hupogramos, and it refers to a pattern that's placed under a piece of paper to be traced. My, my daughter had this little box. She loved that box. I can't remember who gave it to her, but I guarantee you she does if it was one of you. Thank you. And she would, it had a light, and you would turn this light on, uh, and you would put your picture on it, and then a blank piece of paper on top of the picture and you could trace it. And so a little five-year-old could make these beautiful pictures that no five-year-old should ever be able to make. Uh, the, I, I still couldn't do it even with that thing. This is what the word is. Jesus is the picture. And we put our lives over it, and in His light, called the, the Word of God and the glory of God, we try to trace our lives according to the pattern of Jesus Christ that He laid down for us. And so I, I want to walk in his steps. I, I want to be an example. I want to follow. Uh, it says so that it, when you do this example, you can follow in his steps. And the Greek word is footprints. I, I want to walk in the footprints of Christ. I, I, I want to walk. I want to live and think and speak the way that he spoke on this earth. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I want you to be able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen a little bit of the Father. You know, to, to walk in his steps and to show this. 
Don't you want to live like that? Unjust suffering was his path to glory. And he says, that if you want to walk in my steps, it will be for you as well. You will walk in these steps. That is the cost of Christianity. And he's saying, quit trying to find an escape exit. I didn't come to give you a simple, easy life. Don't keep trying to find a safer way. Don't try to fit into this world because if you just let up enough, the world's going to love you and applaud you for your moralism. But if you will walk and speak the way Jesus spoke, they're going to come against you and hate you and you're going to get unjust, mistreatment, scoliosis, all of that stuff. <clears throat> so look at the pattern that he left for us in verse 22. Peter's going to now, from verse 22 to the end of this chapter, he's going to quote Isaiah 53 five times now regarding the suffering of Christ. And so I want you to come back. Peter watched the whole thing. He watched this whole horrible thing. And when the Spirit was given, Peter now gets Isaiah 53, was a prophecy of what he had watched with his own eyes of the lamb being slaughtered. And I imagine few have ever felt the impact of this verse as Peter has. And now he's going to bring it up. And so the first one he quotes is in Isaiah 53, 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. There's no violence. It, it, that word meant sin. In the Septuagint, it's lawlessness. Jesus never violated the law of God. That was his response to unjust violence. Uh, he, it, there was no verbal attack. There was no uh, lashing out, reaching back, speaking. Any, it just, he took it. All the accusations and the abuse and the cruelty that came upon the Son of God was unjust. And maybe everything that you're facing right now is unjust. It's not because you're being obnoxious. It's unjust, and they're coming on you, and it's wrong, and it's not even fair. Well, I want you to lift your eyes, quit looking at your circumstances and moping and living in those, and lift your eyes and look to Jesus Christ. Look to Christ. In Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. One of my great struggles is being falsely accused. I just want to defend. I want to retaliate. I want to threaten. And Jesus didn't do any of these fleshly responses. He, he was silent. While being reviled, it's a present tense participle. They just kept reviling him. And they just kept reviling him again and again. He went before Pilate and Herod and the soldiers, and they were reviling him, and he just stayed silent. No threats. He had the power to destroy them with a word. Nothing. And my question is, how did he do it? Because you might say, well, he's a son of God. <laughs> that helps. How did he do it? In Luke, it says he, he entrusted himself to the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Spirit of God. Jesus came and perfectly submitted. So we get a picture of perfect humanity being led by the Spirit of God. All that he did was through the Spirit of God. And so here he is on a cross, and it says he kept entrusting himself to him, his Father, who judges righteously. The word entrust, it meant to hand over to, to someone to keep. Here, Father, Again and again and again, they kept reviling, and it's, it's the present tense as well. He just keeps entrusting it over and over. He's handing himself to the Father. He just he persecute me, accuse me. He kept entrusting himself to his Father again and again and again until his very last hurt words. He says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I, I've entrusted all of this, and now I give you my very life as I breathe my last and die I entrust myself, my spirit, to you, Father. The last thing he said, he gave himself to his Father, that he would deal justly and righteously with all of these accusers. So I ask you this morning, do you believe that God can handle dealing with those who mistreat you and say all kinds of evil against you? Do you believe that God can handle that? That's where everything should be entrusted and given. Entrust it to the one who can bring about a righteous judgment because mine will never be. 
I never understand things rightly, properly. I'll overreact or underreact. There is only one who knows perfect righteousness and justice. And I can take all of these abuses. I'll never be saying, it's okay, it's right. It's, I give them to you, Father. I entrust them to you to deal with this rightly. I'm not going to take it into my own hands to do this. Only God is good enough to bring retaliation and trust it to Him. Brethren, the, the cost of being a follower of Christ in our land is going to increase in persecution. I think everyone knows there's no argument. You can see the decay of our society, truth, where the government's moving, where everything's going. It's just simple to see it's increasing, and it will increase. And you're going to get unjust and unfair treatment. It's going to come upon you. And are we going to fight it and argue and yell and scream and sue them? Or are we going to look to Christ? And are we going to suffer? Suffering is the path to glory. And this is the way that glorifies God and saves and silences our critics. If we will do this. This is the means that God uses to show his glory to this world. And trust it to God who will deal with it with perfect equity and give it over to God this morning if you're still holding on to it, trying to make the other person pay, sleepless nights, all of those things. Keep entrusting it to God. Respond in grace and love and honor and submission to these authorities that have been placed over us. Amen? And by doing such, we will be following in the pattern and the example of Jesus Christ. I'm going to close with, I think, one of the most beautiful moments in history. There's been so many, but this one has always stood out to me. This was in May of 1555. Hugh Latimer was going to be burned at the stake for his reformed convictions, really the, the five solos that we studied in October, for holding to those truths now. Uh, he's going to be burned, and he writes this beforehand. And he says, Die once we must. How and where we know not, but here is not our home. That's how this whole letter began, we're aliens. Let us therefore accordingly consider things, having always before our eyes that heavenly Jerusalem and the way thereto in persecution. And let us consider all the dear friends of God and how they have gone after the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose footsteps let us follow even to the gallows if God's will be so, not doubting, but as he rose from the dead on the third day, even so shall we by the time appointed by God, that when the trumpet shall blow and the angels shall shout and the Son of Man shall appear. And so he has his absolute confidence in it. And on the day as he was led to the stake with his friend Ridley, he said this, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust, shall never be put out. And as they were burned at that stake, they did light a light of the marvelous light of the glory of God. And they, 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 they were faithful to live faithful lives and preach and teach this word of God. And then they, they, they entrusted themselves to the government. And the government put them to death. And as they were put to death, they graciously and humbly submitted to it. And it just lit a fire that couldn't be stopped in the, in the whole Reformation and all that God did. Isn't that beautiful? I, I pray that we would do the same, that we would light a light in South Denver and all the areas where we live as we will go live for the name of Jesus Christ and put that name on display and that we'll suffer patiently and humbly and graciously with all the persecution that will come against us as we live these faithful lives. So may we walk in the footprints of Jesus Christ and I pray that he would get all the glory. And now we're gonna go to the table and we're going to look at, at his footsteps that went all the way to Calvary's tree for us. And so I pray that next week we'll come and examine that that cross is the power where we can go live these lives. So let, let's come and, and look at what Christ did for us and, and just again be reminded of our hope and the beauty and the glory and what we have that we can suffer and endure because we have everything in Christ Jesus. Our future is secure. 
And so we thank God for what he's given us. Let's close in prayer and then I'll ask the ushers to come pass out the elements. Father, we come before you and I thank you for the one writing this epistle. It had been the last one as we read the gospels that we would have ever thought would write a book on submission. And yet by your perfect work and the way you work in each one of our lives, Lord, you break us. You bring the things into our lives necessary to get these submissive, humble, gracious spirits to you, to those who will learn how to entrust themselves to a faithful creator and doing what is right. God, I pray that we will more and more learn how to live under your hand, that we can learn the joy of freedom of being a slave to you. God, we are free to serve you and to serve you alone, and we thank you for this gospel. And so I I pray, Lord, that you will raise up a people here at Southside Bible Church. God, that we would together show forth the excellencies of, of you who called us out of this darkness to your marvelous light. God, I pray that as we treasure Christ and hold him and love him and are living like him and walking in his steps and being persecuted and not fighting and resistance and proving ourselves, but just being gracious and submissive and having excellent behavior among them, oh God, we pray that you would use these things to save many, that those would would look and say, what kind of people are they? What kind of God do they serve? And that many would be drawn to Jesus Christ by the excellent behavior of this local assembly. And so, God, we pray for your grace because we admit our flesh, when it is wronged, Lord, we respond wrong. We lash. We, we can't sleep. We want to get even. And I pray, God, that you would let us look at Jesus, that we would look to that perfect example and that our hearts would be set free. We've never endured anything like that, and we deserve 99% of what we get. And so I pray God, give us that kind of response and let us put you on display as we walk like our our perfect son of God. And I thank you for him and I thank you now that we get to remember him. And I pray that every heart would just be refreshed and encouraged that we will never have to stand in your furnace of wrath because he stood in our place and we have a full atonement, full forgiveness. God, let every heart be encouraged and strengthened and lifted this morning as we remember. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.